and good morning everybody and welcome to another episode of The Unlock Show. I'm your host Tracy Wilson and it's like I always say, it's always my pleasure to be here with you guys. I absolutely love jumping on this show and sharing amazing experts like the one I have got with me today. Today I'm particularly excited uh, because this person that I've got on the screen with me, over here somewhere, there, uh, Brian, <laughs> Brian Brown, is one of my favorite people. Um, I've known Brian for about three years now. We've been uh, you know, mixing in the same circles and I'd have to say that above all, he is just an amazing, really neat person to know. Um, and I wanted to have him on the show because not only is he a great guy, but he also knows his stuff. I'm not going to steal his thunder and tell you all of his backstory because I think it's um, it's a story that I want you guys to hear directly from Brian about how he actually has come to be doing what he's doing right now, which is he's in the space of actually helping entrepreneurs, influencers, and CEOs move from great to extraordinary. And he actually crafts these really amazing custom tailored wellness plans that actually help people to uncover the hidden imbalances that we have. Um, and I want to say, you know, hidden is off is an optimal, you know, optimal word that uh, often we don't even know that we've got these imbalances. And Brian is able to get to the bottom of those and help you to really dominate and be able to uh, maxim attain that optimal level of performance and maintain it over a long period of time for life, in fact. So I want to welcome Brian to the show. Um, I know that today, for those of you who are CEOs that are entrepreneurs that are, you know, in the thick of it, and sometimes, you know, it can get to the point where you're feeling a bit sick and tired of just feeling sick and tired because we, we work ourselves, I'm going to say almost to death, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, it's very, very easy to fall into, uh, into that trap. And Brian, uh, Dr. Brian Brown is going to help us to see what those imbalances are, help us to overcome some of those and really help us to stay at our peak performance particularly through the holiday season that we are about to, um, you know, that is that is upon us. In a few months' time, we're going to be in Christmas, and we all know what happens then. You know, energy levels start to drop because you're all so busy doing the things that you do. So welcome to the show. Without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Brian, and I want you to just give everybody a bit of a backstory as to, like, how did you come to be doing what you're doing right now? Like, And I know there was this transition uh, in there, so tell us about that. Yeah. Great, great question. And thank you for the awesome introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to this for uh, ever since you asked me. So I'm glad to be here. Um, so yeah, uh, how did I get into uh, doing what I'm doing? You know, I started out life in, in practicing psychiatry. Uh, that's what I was board certified to do. That's what I was trained to do. And um, it, uh, it, it wasn't what I thought it was. Uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, I have a heart for helping people. And um, that's my biggest desire. But I, at the end of the day, I felt like I was really just poking pills down people's throats. Um, and, and we weren't getting any kind of uh, lasting results. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, people were saying, you know, I really don't feel like I'm any better now than I was three years ago when we started working together. I mean, I'm not suicidal, but and that's a good thing. But I, I just, my depression is no better. And uh, layer in on top of this. This personal journey that I was going through, a uh, 16-year journey with nine different anxiety and depression medications, and um, I, and I looked at myself and reflected upon myself and realized, oh my gosh, I'm not any better either. You know, I, I think my patients are right. Um, I don't think that what we're doing actually works. And um, at the same time, I was um, in this place where I'd had. 40 years of uh, diagnosed night terrors. And in psychiatry, that's a pretty common thing. So I just kind of accepted it and moved on um, with my adult life because only less than 1% of adults carry that into their adult life. And then uh, one day, uh, and I've been having these episodes uh, all throughout the uh, my childhood and my adulthood every single night, uh, one to three, sometimes four or five episodes per night where I'd wake up panicky, short of breath, profuse sweating, heart pounding out of my chest. And again, I was diagnosed with night terrors. And then I hit age 45 and I'm driving my car one day 
uh, on the interstate. And I nearly wrecked because I have one of these episodes in the car. And and my psychiatric brain was like, OK, I'm not anxious. I have no reason to be anxious. I don't know where this is coming from. So I immediately thought, OK, this is cardiac. This is a heart condition. And I drove to a friend of mine's office who is a cardiologist. Um, long story short, they did this million dollar workup and I was diagnosed with a rare pediatric condition that I should have been diagnosed with as a child. And I wasn't. It was misdiagnosed as uh, as night terrors. And the electrophysiologist, the heart specialist, he said, you know, you're you're a very bl blessed person because we do not see adults with this condition. Um, they just don't live long enough to to uh, to to be diagnosed as an adult. Uh, so you're very blessed and very fortunate to be alive. And I got a pacemaker put in and I haven't had a single one of those episodes since. But the damage that it did to my body, years and years and years of adrenaline exposure, uh, because that's what would happen every night. My heart would stop every single night. I, I jokingly say I'm the guy that died over 14,600 times and lived to tell about it uh, because 365 days times 40 years is 14,600. And um, but it damaged my adrenal glands. And um, I. I I had very low energy. I gained up to 390 pounds. I was depressed. I struggled with uh, mild anxiety, mild to moderate anxiety, and was on all these medications for anxiety and depression. And I set out on a journey to fix myself uh, because my traditional medical training couldn't fix me. I, I went to my professional peers and said, hey, can you help me with this? And their answer was, hey, you just need to you need to lose weight. You need to exercise more and eat less. And I'm like, if I eat any less than I'm eating now, I'm going to dry up and blow away because I was eating hardly nothing, eating fewer than a thousand calories a day. And, um, and and I couldn't get anywhere. So I started looking at Eastern medicine. I started looking at functional medicine. I started looking at integrative medicine and uh, realized that uh, I could get help in those areas, started acupuncture, started chiropractic, started working with a naturopathic doctor and a functional medicine doctor. And as I like to say from the children's nursery rhyme, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that's exactly what I did over the course of about 15 months. And after I came through that, I'd, I had closed down my office practice. And after I came through that, I decided that uh, I think I can help other people do the same thing I've done. And so I reopened my practice doing exactly what I'm doing today. And that's helping people optimize their life, find those hidden root causes for what's going on uh, that's 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 cutting their legs out from under them and help them get it back on their feet and excel in, in life again. Well, I'm going to say thank goodness that you got to the bottom of it and that you're still here today because we would not have met and you wouldn't be here helping the thousands and thousands of people that you do um, that you do now. So thank goodness for that. But look, one of the it's in today's um, day and age, like that doesn't happen that often. I think people often go to the doctor. Um, we we put our trust in in yeah. you know the medical system to give us the right things to fix us. And often they don't necessarily get to the root cause of what the problem is. And in your case, wow, like that is not just, you know, a small thing. That was life threatening um, had it not been um, had it not been exposed. And you being the person that actually did the exposing of that um, yourself through, you know, obviously a lot of research and uh, dedication to fix, you know, fix yourself. So one of the things that I know that I've seen um, on, you know, seen you speak about and uh, that you've you've written about is these five buckets of total body health. And I know that, um, you know, in terms of like being an entrepreneur and doing the things that we do, like I mentioned in the in the intro, often we don't always think about our own body. You know, we're so focused on doing the tasks and the daily things that we need to do that That's right. we take a secondary seat. So one of the things I want to know from you is like, how, how, I, I want to explore like what are some of the telltale signs 
Um, I want you to talk about the five, the, these five buckets of total body health, because I think that's extremely important. And what some of our viewers can do to actually make, start making some inroads to start looking after themselves, because I want them all to be around so that they can go out and make a real big difference in this world. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So yeah, the five buckets, just a brief history about that. Um, uh, over the years of seeing clients, client after client after client, I've always asked this question on the initial evaluation. If you had a magic wand that could erase three things, what would it be? And I asked that to the audience today, you know, think about that. What are those three things that you would just like to see disappear if you could just wave a magic wand? Uh, but I was collecting all this data and I wasn't doing anything with it. And then it dawned on me one day, I was like, I need to do something with that data. So I had a college student come in and uh, put all of that information into a Google Sheets. And um, once I got that into a Google Sheets, I ran it through a keyword density analyzer for search engine optimization, believe it or not, and looked at all of the keywords. And all of the keywords dropped into five buckets. Once, once we clustered them all together, they dropped into five buckets. Uh, the brain bucket, the body bucket, the energy bucket, the immune bucket, and the sleep bucket. So those are the five domains or buckets where somebody is going to struggle at some point. So since developing that uh, five bucket system, I've come to the realization that 95% of the time people complain about fatigue. Fatigue is the primary symptom that most everybody complains with, whether it's whether they describe it as fatigue or low energy or uh, I just don't have my drive like I used to. Those are the things that they complain about. And you can look at each of these buckets. And what I've determined now is that there's actually a way that you can use uh, those buckets to change your approach. For example, if somebody comes in and they said, you know, Brian, I'm really struggling with depression and anxiety. And I, uh, I have what, what I call a symptom matrix questionnaire. Uh, it's quite extensive tool. I don't have it down to where it's uh, user friendly uh, for, for general uses. I only use it with high ticket clients. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to complete, 20 to 30 minutes to complete. But by the time they get through that tool, I understand the exact code that they are and which order, whether it's a brain that's first. So you think if they are depressed and anxious, you would think, OK, that falls in the brain bucket. But what if their immune system symptoms are higher than their depression and anxiety? Well, what that means and what I've found clinically is that this person that complains of depression and anxiety, but when they fill out this questionnaire, they trigger out as immune. Uh, that simply means they probably have an autoimmune condition that is triggering their depression and anxiety. So let's look at something different using the same example of depression and anxiety. Let's say that that person uh, triggers out and um, they trigger out with sleep as their primary core bucket that they're having problems in. Well, that generally means that the depression and anxiety is subsequent to the uh, sleep bucket. So if we address the primary bucket first, then we're able to take care of everything else and all the dominoes just fall into line. Um, so this is not something that I had figured out 22 years ago. Uh, when I first started clinical practice, it's been an evolution over the past 22 years and really putting together this model and this pathway to understand. Uh, now, I just ran the numbers earlier this afternoon. Um, uh, all, all of my clients that I work with now within 12 weeks will say they have a 70 percent reduction in fatigue within the first 12 weeks. And it's because we're able to target the primary bucket that needs to be focused on first. Nowhere in general practice do you ever see this. I call it the difference between mainstream medicine, midstream medicine, and genesis medicine. Genesis medicine is what I practice because we start not only at the root cause, but at the base level of everything, and that's genetics. I love that. And you know, that, those numbers are super impressive. I mean, who would not be happy with those to have, you know, the number of clients that you've got that are having the results that they are. And I bet most of them have tried traditional, you know, uh, mainstream medicine to try and fix yep. something before they come to you. 
absolutely um, you know, it'd be quite interesting to even even see what those numbers are because you know I, I know that most will have gone uh, several times to uh, to their GP and then gone, this is just not working and I need something different. Yeah, so, I've actually got those numbers, Tracy. Um, do you? Yeah, the average client that comes to see me has seen 4.2 medical providers before they get to me. And they've either been told there's nothing wrong with you or there's nothing we can do or everything is normal. We hear those three things over and over and over. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I wouldn't be on this call. I'd be sitting on a beach in Tahiti somewhere. So, uh -huh. I mean, yeah. what's interesting about that is that the people that know your body best is is you. So if you think that there's something wrong, um, you know, without being you know, hypochondriac, there probably yep. is something. And yep. uh, you know, going and being told there's nothing wrong with you, you know, often can be really, um, really frustrating and really depressing. So then, and, at what point should they come to you? So uh, when they're fed up, that's mm -hmm. a, that's the simple answer. Is because uh, the clients that I work with are tenacious. I mean, they're 100, 210 percent tenacious. They're just they're exactly what you just described just there is that they don't give up. They don't settle for that answer of, hey, there's nothing we can do with, for you or this is normal. They don't they're not satisfied with that answer because they're intuitive. They know their body and they're smart enough to realize, no, this is not normal uh, in anybody's universe. This is not normal. So they keep pushing for answers and they keep pushing for answers. The interesting thing is, is by the time they get to me, they're so skeptical because they've been burned so many times. When I tell them the results that we get and what we can do for them, they're going, oh, really? Uh, there's no way. And I'm like, yeah, yeah it, it is a way. It, we, we get these results and, and give me 12 weeks and I'll prove it to you. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, our, our people are tenacious. Those are the people that we work with and, and the ones that just don't want to give up. And the sad thing is uh, about 50 percent, maybe a little bit better of those clients because they've been told everything's normal so long. They've been to so many different specialists and doctors. Um, eventually, they're going to find a medical professional out there that reads that entire medical record and they're going to go, this is a psychiatric patient. It's really all in their head and they give them a prescription for an antidepressant. And sadly, a lot of times out of sheer desperation, the, the, the person, the client will actually take that and say, maybe they're right. Maybe I just am crazy and maybe I do need to be on an antidepressant. And then they get no benefit from that. And they end up in my wheelhouse and, and we, we end up getting them, getting them the results that they want. Yeah. Wow. Well, look, I want to know, um, you know, why is energy the like the number one complaint? Is that the number one complaint that you get? And and why do you think that is? Yeah. So uh, if you ask 53 percent of working Americans and I don't have the world worldwide statistics in other westernized countries, but 53 percent of American workers, whether they're entrepreneurs or employees, will say that they feel less productive because of fatigue. 43% of workers will tell you that they don't feel like they can make it through their day because of fatigue. So those are huge numbers. And, and just in the United States alone, uh, it costs the US economy $400 billion every single year in either lost wages or you know lost time from work. Uh, uh, health expenses and insurance premiums that employers have to pay. Uh, it's very costly. Fatigue is very costly. So when you look at these other numbers for these other buckets, they just don't pan out like fatigue. Fatigue seems to be this, fatigue and energy seem to be this universal umbrella that kind of covers all of them. Um, so it's no surprise that it kind of rises to the top. Mm hmm and and so with um you know i suppose this this situation of fatigue like what what are you seeing as um why do you think that is happening like is there been a major shift in that like are, are we seeing an incline in that or a decline in the way in which people are feeling um from a fatigue perspective no i think uh, that way? yeah 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 no i don't think it's always been that way i think over time 
uh, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Uh, we live in very busy societies now. We live with uh, media readily available right in our hands. Uh, we can't get away from it. We have to pur purposefully train our brains. OK, I've got to put this on Do Not Disturb and put it down for four hours uh, during my working day so I'm not exposed to it. Uh, I've got to turn the TV off. I call this uh, a media diet. It's one of the things that I recommend for clients to do. Listen, give yourself a four-week media diet. Take a break from the news. Don't read any news. Don't watch any news. Don't listen to any news. And see how much better you feel. Um, and and so we've got all of that uh, going on from a social standpoint. And then from a physical standpoint, we have um, we have an increased exposure rate. Uh, for chemicals that are entering our, our bodies, whether we inhale them or they're on our skin or we ingest them from our food sources, which is probably one of the worst culprits. Um, so we have all of these different exposures that attack the organ systems and the neurological system and the brain in our body to make us have low energy and fatigue. So there's all these things. Fatigue is, I always say fatigue is complex, but it's not complicated. Uh, it's complex in that it has multiple angles uh, that come in to create that condition we call fatigue or low energy. Um, and my job is, is to start looking at that from an assessment standpoint. And that's why I created the symptom matrix questionnaire, because it helps me dial down into five buckets and understand where I need to start. If there's an exposure issue, if there's an immune issue or a, a neurological issue, or this is physically in the body somewhere, it helps me narrow that down. And what, like when somebody comes to you and you've kind of, I mean, do you start there? I mean, you get right to the bottom of what the what the root cause is. But often from what I'm hearing, like fatigue is kind of like the, the big, like you're saying, the big umbrella that most people would would recognize as being like the first real symptom. I'm like, I'm tired. I'm not feeling well. I'm just feeling off. Uh, this is just not normal. Right. Um, I'm just fed up and sick up, sick of, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sick and tired. Yeah, sick and tired of being yeah. sick and tired. And and therefore they start to um, to want to do something about it. What are some of the? I mean, other than like getting off, not watching the news. And I could not agree with you more. I have, don't watch the news, haven't probably watched it for, I reckon, two years. Yeah. And a massive difference, just just not interested in the negativity yeah. that goes with it. But what are some of the other tips that people could do to really get themselves to at the attainment of optimal um, you know, peak energy? And then what are some of the things that they can do to try to maintain that? Yeah, there's some there. There are seven basic things that people can do starting today that can actually help them uh, start to regain control or reclaim their energy, uh, because all of these things rob us of our energy. The first one is hydration. Uh, Seventy five percent of adults worldwide are dehydrated. Well, dehydration. Yeah, there you go. And uh, a one liter bottle here. I drink four of these a day. Uh, so. Yeah, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Because if you're dehydrated, your attention, concentration, and focus is off. You're more depressed. You're more anxious. Uh, you have more brain fog. You have lower energy. You have uh, multi-organ system slow, slowing down or shutting down. Uh, your, your blood is thicker, so you're more prone to having cardiovascular accidents. If you're dehydrated, your liver doesn't function as well. Your kidneys don't function as well. Your pancreas, your GI system, the neurological system, it goes on and on and on. Uh, so hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Uh, this, the second thing that I would say is uh, along the lines of hydration, and there are going to be a lot of people who may not like this, is avoid alcohol. Alcohol dehydrates like crazy. And... Um, if it's hard liquor, it doesn't necessarily raise the blood sugar, but it raises insulin and hyperinsulinemia can cause issues with fatigue. So it, that's that's with hard liquor. If it's beer or wine, they actually have a lot of sugar in them. So you're not only get to, getting the insulin spike, but you're also getting the blood sugar spike. And when when which will lead into my next thing, and I'll explain here in just a second, it creates this vicious roller coaster ride of the blood sugar goes up 
And then the body has to do something with it. So it releases insulin to drive the blood sugar down. And that's when you have that energy crash. So if there's anybody on this call today that um, has ever been in that place to where they're in this vicious cycle of needing to eat something sweet or drink some caffeine every two to four hours, it's because you're creating this roller coaster ride with your with your energy cycles that is uh, uncontrollable and, and you have to stop that process. So avoid alcohol, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, and, and this is the next one, avoid sugar uh, because sugar in and of itself uh, is, is, is dangerous from the standpoint that um, it, it attacks every organ in your body. Uh, it stresses out almost every organ in your body if it's too high. And we got to get sugar under control. Thanks to the research of Dr. Jason Fong in Toronto, Canada, uh, we actually now understand that blood sugar itself was the, the, was the wrong metric to, to, to monitor and measure. It's actually insulin. Uh, but insulin and, and sugar are directly correlated. And we, we, check, we check insulin levels on all of our patients uh, every, every time we do lab work because we want to understand metabolically where they are. But avoiding sugar, cutting sugar out of your diet is very simple. And then understanding that there are certain foods that your body recognizes as sugar, like corn. Uh, your body has a hard time differentiating between sh regular white table sugar and corn. Uh, it has a hard time differentiating between a white potato and corn. It has a hard time differentiating between bread or wheat, uh, gluten, if you will, and corn and, and and sugar. So they're they're all they're all interpreted as sugar to the body. So if we can avoid those types of things, we actually set up or set ourselves up better for uh, a higher energy states. Um, and the the other one I joke I laugh every time I I, I read this. Uh, move your mass. Um, you have to move. We have to have purposeful movement. I, I work with clients all the time and say, "Oh, I have a standing desk." Well, I've got a standing desk, but I'm not moving. Or they um, they work in businesses where they're walking the hall hallways of their business all day long, um, and they say, "Oh, I got ten thousand steps in today." You did, but you were in a state of distress when you did that because work is stressful. So you need to purposefully downregulate so you can cut your brain off, go out in nature and go for a walk. That's the cheapest thing you can do. Uh, if you're more motivated and you've got a home gym, you can pick weights up and put them down. That's another way of moving your mass. Uh, but we need to move as human beings. Uh, this, bo this body, this skeletal structure was designed to move. Um, and then make time to breathe. We've all got to make time to breathe. I think if you look at people in stressed states today, all over the world, especially in the westernized world, we don't inhale fully. We don't exhale fully. Therefore, those toxins that our body is trying to get rid of through our lungs, they just sit there in the lungs and they get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. So we have to learn to inhale and exhale properly. Take a break two, one or two times a day in the middle of your day and just say, OK, I'm just going to do one minute of focus breathing, really deep breath in, really deep breath out and, and do that uh, over and over and over for about a minute straight. And if you're really industrious, you can do that for a minute and then take a break for about 30 seconds. Go back and do another minute. Take a break for 30 seconds. Go back and do it for another minute. It really clears the brain. It really energizes the body. You'll actually feel tingly all over when you do that. Um, and that's because the cells in your body are reacting to that detoxification that you're putting it through. And the last thing I would say is sleep. Make sure you get plenty of sleep. Uh, one in three people in the Western world do not get enough sleep. Uh, that's 33% of people. And if not getting enough sleep, Again, every system in the body, including the brain, begins to slow down. It begins to become more sluggish. And that's not good for any of us. In fact, if you look at one of the contributors to uh, suicide, uh, lack of sleep is one of those contributors. Uh, so we, we, we really need to be on top of sleep. And, and I would probably say sleep is the, the number three reason people complain and want to come in to see me. It's like, I'm not sleeping. I've tried everything. I've been everywhere. Nothing works. And typically there's an imbalance there, whether it's a, a methylation genetic imbalance or a neurotransmitter uh, genetic imbalance 
or a detoxification imbalance somewhere in the genetics that once we identify it, we're able to start working on that and getting it under control and they start sleeping better. Fantastic. Well, I've got some questions based on what you've uh, what you've awesome. spoken about. So the first one was water um, and you know hydrating. And I'd have to say, like, I've got to put my hand up, man. I'm going to be hydrating much better than I have been because um, I'm I have not been very good at that. So I will get better yep. at it now that I know all of the consequences of not doing it. Yeah. My, yep. my question is. Um, does it make a difference? That t- this might be a, it might be a crazy question, silly question, but it doesn't make a difference the type of water that you drink. Does it matter? Regular old tap water? Should you go get alkaline? Should you, you know, like pH balance? What what type of water should you drink? Does it matter? Yeah. So, uh, great question. Excellent question. In fact, um, you know, I'm into water filtration, but I don't expect that of my clients. Okay, because remember 75% of people are dehydrated. If that can, if I can get them to drink any water and build that habit, um, I will work on cleaning up the water later. Okay. Ideally you want a clean water source. All right. So if you know that your municipal water, your tap water is not as clean and it's not as high standards as you would like, then you're probably going to want to get bottled water. Okay. Then you've got the argument for plastic. Do you want that in a plastic bottle? Well, I don't like plastic. I don't put anything in plastic. I use a stainless steel bottle myself, uh, but I control the things that I can control. I teach this all the time uh, because people will say, well, you've got plastic water lines coming into your house. You can't control that. Nope, I cannot control that. But I can control what I put that water in once it comes out of the tap or once it comes through my filtration system. So control the things you can control, but hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I really don't care where you get your water from, just get your water. Uh, A lot of times people like to put these flavoring drops in there uh, because they say, oh, I I just don't have a taste for water. I don't like water. Um, uh, The reason you don't have a taste for water is because you're dehydrated. Uh, What happens is, is the brain is really, really smart. And it will cut off your natural thirst drive so that you're no longer thirsty because it doesn't want to torture you. It really thinks that you're in a a desert like situation and and you're you're dehydrated uh, because there's no available water. So therefore, it cuts off your thirst drive and you no longer have that sensation of thirst. It's different for everybody, but I would say the average is about three to four weeks Once you start drinking water and you force yourself to drink water, your thirst drive will kick in and you will naturally start craving water. So usually by the time I see someone, if I'm following up every two weeks, it's usually that second visit. If I'm following up once a month, it's usually that first visit. They'll go, oh, my gosh, it was so hard to drink that water until last week. And then all of a sudden it just broke loose. And now all I want is water. I just crave water. So women should be drinking two to three liters of water per day. Men should be drinking three to four liters of water per day, depending on how busy you are. If it's a if it's an off day for me where I'm not working out, I'm probably going to drink more like three liters. But uh, today was a workout day for me. So I'm actually on my fifth liter right now and I crave it. My body wants it. That's what I'm going to give to it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, that, yeah. that- I know that that's a question that a lot of people would ask. Do I have to drink a particular type of water? As long as the water's wet, get yourself going, and then you get can you get you know, as you say, Absolutely. You can work on the quality of that water a little bit later. The next is um, sugar. So, you know, cut out. I mean, this is, again, will be one of those things that a lot of people, like, struggle with. There is sugar in almost everything that yep. we consume. So how do how does one... Uh, eliminate sugar and are there uh, some alternatives or a way of let's call it weaning yourself off the sugar to a get to a point where you no longer require sugar right so um there's two ways to get off sugar cold turkey and wean yourself off the yeah. cold turkey method i can promise you if you're a sugaraholic uh, if you go cold turkey, you will have a flu-like syndrome for about two to three days. Uh, you'll ache and you'll have a headache uh, because your body's literally in withdrawal from sugar. Uh, I personally think if you're hydrating well, that is the best way. So a lot of times if I've got somebody that I know is a sugaraholic, I have them get their water 
uh, re, their, their natural thirst restored first. So we make sure we're drinking plenty of water. And then I have them just go cold turkey off sugar. If you're not into uh, personal torture, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can do this other method. And that is just barely wean, re, start weaning yourself off. So I'm not big on artificial sweeteners. Okay. I think there's a, I think the, the jury's still out on a lot of those, but if we look at the, the, the more recent science, uh, they cause things like memory loss. They cause things like headaches. Uh, they cause things like GI disturbances. We're, we've now learned just in the past 18 months that uh, some of the artificial sweeteners actually disrupt the natural gut uh, microbiome or the healthy bacteria. So it makes them not function like they should, which lowers your immune system. So there's a lot of reasons not to do artificial sweeteners. I would stay away from those. Um, if you're going to do a sweetener, I would stick with something more natural. Um, if you're not a diabetic, you can use something like a blue agave. Uh, you can use honey. Uh, and what I would prefer is probably more stevia uh, on, on that end. Um, it, it's really best if you can just kind of get rid of it altogether because your taste buds will crave the sweet taste, regardless of whether it has a, an effect on your body or not uh, from a natural sweetener. So and, and with the blue agave syrups and and things like that, uh, the honeys, they will raise your blood sugar and they will raise your insulin. Not as bad as white table sugar, but they will do that. So the best thing to do is go cold turkey if you can. But if you actually need training wheels, use something like stevia or blue agave or honey. And those are those are training wheels until you feel like you can fly on your own and pull that back. Um, I would say also just so you can get your taste buds developed to craving things that are naturally sweet start incorporating apples and things like that um, into your diet. I see Donald Gifford asked a question about xylitol there. Xylitol is actually acceptable. Um, a lot of people don't tolerate it from a GI standpoint uh, because it causes diarrhea. It can cause GI upset. So I would be a little careful with that if you've got somebody that has known issues with gastrointestinal type problems. Uh, but great question. Great question. Thank you. Now, let's go to uh, movement. So, you know, again, when you're in, particularly if you're doing, you know, a lot of office type work and you're stationary, sedentary for, you know, quite some time, what are, you talked about weights and just getting outside. Um, how does one, you know, I mean, a lot of the time people are, uh, they've had this resistance and not wanting to do that. Again, how can we, um, how can you just, I mean, that might be just get started. But um, what yeah. are some of the things that you can you can do to get yourself started? Well, first of all, you know, you need to make sure that physically you're capable of doing that uh, and start an exercise. So if you haven't had a recent physical, I would recommend getting a physical with your local uh, primary care doctor and just making sure you're OK to start exercising. Uh, that's that's basic uh, basic principle number one out of the way, but let's assume that that you're ready to exercise and, and you want to exercise. If you're going to go into the gym and you're going to start lifting weights, if you can afford it, I would recommend hiring a personal trainer, even if it's for one month, two months, three months, that personal trainer is professionally trained to protect you from injury and teach you how to do those exercises with proper form. Another thing that you can do is participate in an exercise class, whether that be a spin cycle class or a yoga class or a Pilates class um, uh, or a dance class, even you know things that aren't your typical exercise. If you're taking dance lessons three nights a week, that's exercise. You're out there moving, you're doing something to re-energize the brain and re-energize the body. Um, so just keep that in mind is that it doesn't have to be going to the gym and looking like the buff gym rat uh, that always works out, you know, five, six days a week. Uh, you don't have to think that way at all. In fact, you can do something free. And like I said earlier, it's just get out and walk. It's really good to kind of be fresh air, be out in nature. Whether it's hot or cold, it doesn't really matter. If it's hot, get out early in the morning. If it's cold, get out later in the day when it's a little bit warmer. Uh, but get out there and move. Um, you just just do it. Just uh, just like you said, that's the answer. Just do it. Do it. it doesn't matter what the movement looks like. Just do it. Yeah. 
Okay, the next one I want to go to is this, you talked about breath. And, it, you know, we all breathe and it seems such like such a, um, a simple thing to do. But let's help everybody, like let's help them understand what do we really mean by like taking those few minutes of getting really deep breath. Like what would that look like and what should they be experiencing and feeling and to, you know, to do it, to do it right. Right, right, right. So um, if you're going to be breathing to calm yourself down, you're going to be doing slow, slow, more rhythmic, more calm breath. So you're going to be breathing in for a count of three, hold it for a count of three and breathe out for a count of five, a long, slow exhale. And you've got to work on your timing. Uh, it's very, very meditative to breathe with that rhythm and, and it calms you down. It will calm your neuro neurological system down. So if you're a person that tends to be a little keyed up and anxious, that's really really, really good to do is to do that calming breathing right before this show. Um, I mean, I've got a little bit of sweat on the forehead and I, I exercised early this morning, but I have a little sweat on my forehead because I did power breathing. And that's literally taking uh, standing up uh, at attention, arms down by your side, and you're taking in a really full breath uh, for a two count uh, very rapidly, one, two, and you're breathing from your diaphragm chart first, your chest second, and you're exhaling right behind it. And you're doing 12 of those per minute. Take a break for about 20 seconds. And then you repeat that for 12 of those for a minute. Take a break for about 20 seconds. And you do do that four times. So you're doing four minutes of that power breathing uh, that gets your metabolism going. It gets your, your neurotransmitters flowing. It gets your blood flowing. Uh, it actually, yeah, it raises your metabolism because it raises your core temperature. Uh, but it gets you in that state to be energized and focused and attentive and have really good concentration. Uh, you know, Tony, uh, Tony Robbins was really big on that power breathing and getting in state. He actually, everywhere he travels, he has one of those small trampolines in back and he bounces up and down on that trampoline and does his breathing exercises at the same time. I'm not brave enough to try that yet, but um, it, it, uh, I do, I do jump up and down in place and that does help get you in state. But um, that it just depends on what you're wanting to accomplish with your breathing as to what techniques you use. But most people need to use a calming technique. So I would say that that slow rhythmic breathing in and then slow rhythmic breathing out. As long as it's methodical, you don't even have to worry about counting. Just make it methodical and focus on getting the lungs full and fully exhaling. Fantastic. Well, the last thing that I want to come to that you spoke about was sleep. Um, and again, it's one of those things that we often take for granted. You know, you get to the end of the night and you fall into bed and, and you shut your eyes and you hope that you wake up refreshed in the morning. And often uh, for a lot of people, that just isn't the case. So like we hear a lot about you must get X number of hours of sleep. Is there a is there an optimal number of hours of sleep that you should be getting? And B, is there a difference between the type of, you know, uh, the type of sleep that you should be getting? And how do you know if you're getting the right kind of sleep? Right. Excellent. 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 Love this question uh, because I really focus on sleep with my clients, regardless of which bucket they're primarily in, uh, because I know that, uh, you know, one in three people is struggling with sleep. Uh, it seems like my caseload, it seems the, the opposite. It seems like two thirds of people are struggling with sleep to some degree. So I really want to hone in on sleep. One of the first things that I have them do is make sure that they have a morning routine. Uh, and, and you need to know that's a little bit tricky and saying that it's a morning routine because a morning routine actually starts the night before. So you need to set yourself up for success in the morning. Uh, and it starts the night before. In other words, you need to make sure that your alarm clock, which is most people's cell phone, is set across the room uh, and, and away from your bed. Number one, it eliminates the electromagnetic frequency near your head if it's set on a bedside table. You don't want that near your head. You don't want digital alarm clocks near you because they generate an electromagnetic field which can disrupt your sleep. So we're accomplishing that. Number two, it makes us get up out of bed in order to start our day, uh, which is critically important because when we set our telephone across the room, we're also going to have 
a, a, a hand hand towel there where we can wash our face really quickly with cold water to wake ourselves up, dry our face off. Go ahead. Um, I recommend working out in the morning. If you just can't do it, okay, you need to work. We work around that. But go ahead and put your your gym clothes on and get ready for a walk. Just go for a walk. Even if you're not going to exercise right then, a 10 minute walk uh, will do the body good. It gets the blood, blood and juices going and it really sets the body up for sleep the night before, believe it or not. So that morning routine is critical to a proper night's sleep. And when you get into this rhythm of doing the same thing every day, the same bedtime routine and the same morning routine, you set yourself up, you set your body and your brain up, your mind up to be hardwired to go, okay, it's bedtime. I need to go to bed and you want to get in the bed at the same time every night. Um, don't make it nine o'clock one night and then 11 o'clock one night and then one o'clock one night and you're all over the board on your bedtime. Purposefully try to cut off eating two hours before uh, you you go to bed, your intended bedtime and purposefully try to uh, cut off any kind of media or TV two hours before bed because it allows the brain to calm down. It's hard to tell in these lenses, but I actually have blue blocking uh, tint in these lenses and it blocks the blue blue frequency light, uh, which actually helps promote sleep, helps the release of melatonin. So uh, those are just a few things that you can do to help set yourself up for a really good night's sleep. Uh, how do you know you're getting a good night's sleep? Uh, number one, subjectively, you feel rested when you wake up. Number two, you feel mentally clear. And number three, you have a really good energy level. Um, aside from that, there are different tracking devices that you can purchase now on the market. I have my favorites, but, uh, uh, you know, we won't talk brand names or anything on, on the show. Uh, but uh, I always have my clients track their sleep because really and truly, it's the only way to truly know what what stages of sleep you're getting every night and whether you're getting the deep restorative delta sleep, which is critical. Uh, as we age, the amount of sleep that we get or our demand for sleep goes down, but our deep wave, our delta sleep should stay consistent. And hopefully over time, and I see this with my clients, we're actually able to improve their delta wave sleep, the, that restorative sleep and get them sleeping better uh, through that deep sleep phase. All right, we've got a question coming in here, and this is about, um, Robin is asking, how do you feel about naps? Uh, great question, Robin Helm. And hi, hi, Robin, how are you doing, by the way? It's been a long time since I've seen you. Um, how do I feel about naps? Uh, number one, you need to listen to your body. Everybody's uh, different when it comes to naps. I will say this, it doesn't need to be more than 20 minutes. If it's more than 20 minutes, it will actually disrupt your deep sleep patterns at night. So the question for me clinically then becomes, why is this person feeling the need to take a nap during the day? If they're feeling the need to take a nap during the day, there's something broken somewhere in one of those buckets and we need to get to the bottom of it so we can understand why this person feels this desire to have a nap during the day. Um, I don't I don't take naps. I used to religiously Every Sunday afternoon, that was kind of my downtime. I would take an hour, hour and a half nap. Um, I, when I started tracking my sleep, I stopped doing that because I realized on Sunday night, my deep sleep went from 20% down to 1% because I took a nap during the day. Uh, it's that drastic of an effect. And you want your deep sleep to be at least 10%. Uh, mine hovers between 17 and 20, 21% uh, most all the time. But on days that I take nap, my deep sleep goes down to one or two percent. And I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that to myself because it's not good for my health. It's not good for my metabolism to have my sleep crash like that. Mm -hmm. Brian, you mentioned that um, you've got some of your favorites and I have no problem in uh, you sharing what they are because uh, this show is, you know, we want to give people the yep. the and the resources that are going to help them to, you know, live optimal. So feel free to share um, to share what they are, and we can even put them in the link um, after the, you know, in the the comment section after the show and all the show notes. Okay. So that if you need that, okay. um, they can certainly go and grab them. So after the show, we'll make sure that we get them from you, and I'll put them into the show notes so that uh, you know those yep. those that a little bit of help to try and uh, you know manage and uh, you know 
be aware of what sleep they're actually getting, they can go and right. get some of those devices. Yep. So uh, the the Garmin watch company actually makes a line of high performance athlete watches that track sleep. Um, if you're not a serious athlete, it's not worth the expenditure because you're going to spend anywhere from twelve to eighteen hundred dollars for that one watch. Um, so, but if you're a if you're a, a marathon runner or a triathlete. Um, you know, and you're really into measuring what's going on with your body, then by all means do it. I use my Apple watch, uh, just for general purposes, but I use the aura ring and I've been wearing the aura ring for years now. And the aura ring is, uh, is one of the most amazing pieces of technology. Um, it does track movement, but I'm not as impressed with that as I am the sleep data. It, it tracks sleep data down to your body temperature at night. And it will give you a, a report the next morning saying, hey, you know, your readiness is low today because your body temperature was a little elevated last night. Uh, consider taking it easy today because you may not be as ready to tackle this day as you think. Uh, or it'll say something like, we noticed that your heart rate was a little elevated more last night uh, and it didn't come down into those low ranges. Uh, your readiness may be off today. Please take it easy. Um, and what I'll see is, is when we start tracking people's sleep, uh, people start developing these correlations just naturally that, oh, OK, I went out to eat with my friends because it was a birthday celebration and I had three glasses of wine. And, um, you know, I had the big steak and the, and the potato and then we had dessert. So I had gluten, I had sugar, I had alcohol. And then we get to track and see what kind of effect that has physiologically on the body. And it has this horrible effect on the body and that it causes an adrenaline response. We release adrenaline with those exposures, just like we would if a bear were chasing us through the woods. Your body doesn't know any difference between the bear chasing you and the food that you've eaten that has triggered that adrenaline response in your body. But we're able to start seeing that once we start tracking. So my A number one favorite for a newbie that's just starting out, get the aura ring. Uh, it'll be with you for as long as you want to keep wearing it. Um, so yeah, they'll send you a sizing kit and you can uh, size it and then uh, send, get in online, type in your size and they'll, they'll ship you your ring. So yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, you're not the first person on the Unlock show to actually mention the Aura ring. So mm -hmm. um, that is uh, one of the leading tools in this particular industry. So yep. I want to um, like we, you and I, you, you know, we could talk for days and days and days because, you know, this stuff is fascinating. It's interesting. And I know that um, our viewers are absolutely lapping this up. And it's super, it's not just interesting. It's really, really important. Really, really important, particularly for those, you know, everybody who watches the show wants to make a difference in the world. And the only way we can make a difference in the world is to be here for a long time. So we must look after ourselves. So before we, um, before I, I wrap this up, because we've gone for, for quite some time, which has been great, um, is there anything else that you want to add to the mix? Because we're leading into that holiday season. You've given so many um, tips and tools and even resources to help people live, you know, optimally to um, manage their their energy at a peak state. Um, is there anything else that we should be considering or need to be doing? Yeah. Day. So um, if if you're if you're taking the bull by the horns, as 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 we have a phrase here in America, uh, they may have that in Australia as well. But, you know, when when you're taking the bull by the horns and you're deciding, OK, I'm going to start getting a handle on these things that I know I can control, like hydrating and exercising and eating clean and green. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, uh, but making sure that, you know, when you're when you're going to a social event and there's a lot of different foods there, there's a lot of alcohol there. Uh, you want to kind of fill yourself up with fiber, uh, fill yourself up with the veggies. Uh, they're not fun. Uh, they're not as good as the hors d'oeuvres and the other little things over there. Uh, but fill yourself up with those before you go to those other things. I'm not saying that you have to be a teetotaler. I don't agree with that at all. That's not real life. But in this beginning stage, I want you to think 51%. If you can just be at 51% effective on these things, 
then you're going to start making headway. Um, I pride myself on having been 390 pounds and lost down to 250 pounds where I am today. Am I where I want to be? No, I'm not where I want to be. But do I lose weight every single year? Yes. Does the average person in the Western world gain about two to three pounds every year? Yes. So I feel like I'm better than the average person in that I am making progress. So I always say progress, not perfection. And that's where that 51% comes in. Do something today that you know you can control. Do something today you know you can implement and move forward in little bitty baby steps every single day. And before you know it, you'll look back you know, three months, six months, nine months from now, and you'll say, oh my gosh, I'm a different person. I feel totally different. I feel better. Um, and then when you get to that place where you're just saying, okay, I think I'm ready to, you know, go check this out a little bit further and maybe have some advanced lab work done, have some genetics done, um, you know, message me on on Facebook and I'll be glad to chat with you anytime. Well, as soon as we've got to that uh, note, let me just pop up because I, want, I know that uh, our viewers are going to want <clears throat> How can they, you know, learn more about you? So I'm just going to pop up on the screen right now. If you want to follow, um, you want to follow Dr. Brian, you can go to his Facebook page. So the Optimal CEO, you'll find him on Facebook there. And also to BrianGBrown.com, uh, his website, where you can find a lot more information about that. Now, I also know that you have got a brand new program coming out uh, that is due to launch. It'll be in February of next year because I know you're yeah. like, progress over perfection but I know when it comes to actually delivering things for your clients you're a, an extreme perfectionist when it comes to that so I know it's going to be um, a stellar program when it comes out so tell us how can people like if they want to get involved in that and they want to learn more about it is there somewhere they can go yet and if not um, that's no problem I will just make sure that we jump back in uh, when it's ready to go and there's a waiting list or something like that I can let everybody know about it I should have a, uh, a, a waiting list this page up in the next uh, 20 to 30 days. So uh, we're working on it as a work in progress, but it's uh, one of those things that's not up yet. If you're just, if you say, hey, Brian, I need to be on that waiting list, message me on, on Facebook Messenger or Instagram, and I'll be glad to um, put you on the list manually. I know that's old school, but hey, it still works. Um, yeah. Look, You've had an opportunity to talk about, um, you know, the things that you do, uh, you know, that you do to help people. And, uh, you know, so there's a program, but let's say somebody actually wanted some help now and they wanted to work with you. Again, do they just go to Facebook, message you and, uh, you know, spark up yep. the conversation? So that they right can now, I, you know, I've been doing uh, work with uh, clients on a one on one basis and uh, organically uh, just. Uh, just meeting them online and carrying on conversations with them online. Um, so yeah, that's the best way to do it. Um, and I'll be glad to uh, talk with you online as long as you want to. And if you want to hop on a call, we'll hop on a call. I'm really flexible. So yeah. And it doesn't matter anywhere where, where you are in the world. Uh, the, the fortunate thing that uh, we're, we're at with the 21st century is that with genetics, um, I can get genetics done in any Western country in the world. Uh, may take me a little bit to get it there, you know, as far as uh, FedEx or UPS and stuff like that, uh, because it's got to go through customs. But it usually goes pretty quick, and uh, we can get your test kit to you pretty pretty quickly and, and get you tested and get your results back, and then start the ball rolling from there. So um, yeah, I, I have clients in the UK right now and in Australia and in Canada, that is and all, and all over the United States. Well, I want to say thank you so much for being on the, on the Unlock show. I know that um, for those of you who are currently watching, you may be watching on Facebook, YouTube, or even inside of our app, um, the place to be is inside of our Success Secrets for Business, Family, and Life group on Facebook because that is a, a group where not only the Unlock show is being aired, but we also have Vicky Helms show, which is a coffee break show, and uh, Scott Stevens right now, which does another, uh, he, he has a, a show called Another Perspective. All of those shows are set with fantastic guests and information, resources, and tools and strategies to really help you thrive in your business, in your family, and in your life. So just like uh, Dr. Brian Brown has said to us today, it is a holistic, you know, look at your life. 
that is exactly the way in which we look at things too. No one thing is in isolation. We must look at them in their totality. So um, I want to say thank you so much. It's been super fun having you here. Uh, you've given us so many fantastic things, practical things that we can do to start making a difference in our own lives and start feeling better, sleeping better, you know, and just be working at our optimal level on a daily basis. So thank you so much for your expertise and your commitment to our entrepreneurs, CEOs and business owners, because without people like you, we would continue to be going down the path of, let's call it traditional medicine and uh, hitting our heads against a brick wall, so to speak, and not getting the answer. <laughs> Need. So I want to thank you for, uh, you know, for your commitment to, to serving humanity at the highest of levels. So thanks very much for joining me on the Unlock Show. Thank Again, you, Tracy. With all of my guests, I mean, I always have a great time with you guys, and I would love to have you, um, you know, back at another another time, uh, perhaps in the new year. But wishing you all the best with the launch of your new program. I know that the people that are going to work with you are going to have an amazing, uh, amazing. <laughs> and an amazing experience with uh, with somebody like you by their side. So again, thank you for everybody else that has been watching us today. Thank you for joining us on the Unlock Show. Like I always say, it's a pleasure having uh, having the opportunity to speak with you guys and having you guys uh, join me on, a sh on these Unlock Shows. I will be back again on Friday. So my shows run twice a week every Wednesday and every Friday, uh, Brisbane, Australia time, which is 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, this week, I'm going to be coming, uh, I'm going to be dialing in or tuning in, live streaming from a very special location. So you'll get to see another little part of Australia. And, uh, you know, I love being a little bit of an ambassador for, uh, for Australia. So when these borders open, you guys can all come and visit me over here. So that being said, have a fantastic week. And like I always say, continue to live your life unlocked because as you now know there is just no other way thanks and have a great week see you guys thank you